So everybody in here on, on the wireless, it'll be helpful if you can get on the slide deck or at least write down the slide deck, bit.ly slash acte 2019 dc Slide deck's not going away, so as long as Ned from Google over here that he has free storage, then I'll go ahead and leave it up there, okay? You'll always have access to it. Ned, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Ned and Andy, if you don't know them, they're your Google for Education reps. Okay, and I think Ned, you got a booth later. A booth and a data studio presentation. All right, folks, let's see if I can figure out how to juggle the mic, the mouse, and the clicker all the same time. So this morning's, I mean, this morning's afternoon's session, I could do this for seven hours. Well, this could be a lot of information in 50 minutes or so. Um, for the most part, hold your questions. I'll stick around afterwards. I've got a booth tonight. I've got hours tomorrow. Send me an email. Reach out to me. I'll find you somewhere. Okay? We want to make sure we get to most of this content as best we can. That's me, Google for Education Consultant, Amplified IT. I've uh, been with Amplified IT for two years now, or just over two years. Previous to being with them, I was an IT director for 15 years in California. A uh, one to one high school district, about 7,000 students. A uh, not quite one to one K 12 district that just moved over to Duke and Exchange over the PC. Um, previous to that, I was in IT in the Credit Union, and previous to that, I was in IT in the United States. So I've been in the IT world for quite a while. You know Scott? That's that Scott guy over there. Um, if you have ever had a, uh, any access or need anything from Amplified IT, Josh Plasson is more regional account manager. Um, he is responsible for this territory of the country. I, Roz, and Josh are responsible for pretty much everything in this side of the Mississippi. Okay, so if you need anything from us, please reach out to Josh. Roz would be the secondary, but mostly I agree as well. So who here has heard of Amplified IT? So good, about half of you. Small company, I think we're just now to 30 people. Uh, we just hired a couple more. Um, most everybody's in Norfolk, Virginia. I actually reside in Central California. We have one person in Utah, one person in Chicago, Illinois, uh, three in Western Canada, three, four in New York, 
three or four in Scotland, and then the rest of the sales will be more to you. We are 100% focused on you, focused on K-12 for education, helping you guys support and implement your consumer environment. Whether that's something in an audit, like we're talking about today, whether we build your environment, whether it's a lab tool, whether it's our collaborative, where we help you answer questions and get you guys to communicate together, all of those kinds of things, 100% about helping you guys implement these new services. Quick sample of the picture of who works for the company right now. Kind of a representation of the educational institutions that we work with across North America. Yes, we do represent Alaska. We do have folks in Hawaii as well. It's pretty good on that picture. You might learn something today. I hope you learned something today. But as IT folks, we tend to click buttons and not really think of the consequences sometimes. So if you do learn something, write it down, take a note, think about it, share the information before you make that change. Okay? Your environment, your domain, but I've given you the one. Right? So what we're doing this morning is we're quickly going to some best practices, some information about what it's like to get an audit or things you find in an audit. Um, just kind of pick snippets out of different sessions that we do to give you a good overview of your environment. Okay? So G Suite. First thing to know about G Suite. It was never tailor built for you guys. It's built for business. And that's where it started. It was adapted to the education sector. Somebody 10, 12 years ago now decided to give G Suite to education system. Great idea, because now there's a number one in a lot of things out there. But just remember that it was never tailor built for you. They're doing a much better job about thinking of us first now, or thinking about us individually, but still a lot of stuff that comes out is set up for business, and we need to adapt it to our needs. Okay? Kind of why I am glad I can this. Common pitfalls we see when we're working with educational institutions. Uh, a lot of institutions we work with just turned on G Suite, a teacher turned on G Suite, and we've been using it, and there's over 200 settings just for user settings. Lots and lots of things in there, lots of doctors, lots of services, lots of things changing. So really no thought about how they were going to use it, just turned it on in there. Minimal OU structure. The OU structure that you utilize is by far the most important thing you do to manage your DC environment better. If you have a flat OU structure and you're trying to mirror AD or you don't have enough granularity, it makes your job that much harder to manage the environment especially with some of the changes that we have to Default settings, like I said, world's built for the business environment, not for the education environment. So we really want to go in there and change and adapt things to fit our situation. Lack of roadmap, hey, we turned it on. Do we need to turn on anything today? Can we start with just driving docks? Can we start with classrooms? Can we have to have now on? Having a roadmap of how we're going to start and how we're going to kind of roll this out with the time. So Google uh, G Suite for Education Audit. Who in here has had an audit from Amazon? It looks like five, six of you. All right, so a G Suite for Education Audit is a process that we go through to look at every setting inside the Gavin console related to your environment, okay? It starts off with a kickoff call, and in that kickoff call, we gather some information about your environment, we gain access to your environment, and we spend about three to four weeks putting together those audits. The audit encompasses an 80-page report, along with about 10 different sheets, Google sheets, with information about users, information about cabinet roles, information about the IP docs, all kinds of different, different information to support the audit findings. Then we also do an hour and a half to two hour call to discuss those findings and recommendations. We've done two years.
It's not meant to be, like some oddities do an IT, it's, it's kind of a negative experience. This is just meant to give you information, to give you feedback, to give you recommendations, so you can move forward. Okay, it's a really positive process. All right, so starting in the beginning, I think that lots of information just kind of gives you a good overview from the beginning of the DC. About 10, 11 years ago when they started with DC, these we recommended two physically separate domains, one for staff, one for students. Separate admin functions. Can anybody still do that? Okay, your lives are complicated. I had that at class for you in the high school district. I even made it more complicated. My staff were over here, my students were over here, but the student devices were over here with the staff. So it was good So we don't recommend that anymore. Four years, five years forward, Google recommended. Okay, you have a primary domain with a subdomain for your students, or an alias, something like that. Fast forward to now, we recommend, and Google recommends, just a primary domain. Anybody know why we can recommend just a primary domain? I heard it over there. What was it? OU structure. Back in the day, you set, most anything you set, you set at the root. You set at the domain level. You set at the highest level. And it applied to everybody. Now we have more and more and more controls based on the infrastructure. Back to what I said, having a good OU structure makes the environment easier to manage. So there are still reasons to have a subdomain or an alias. It usually has to do with part of your, part of your staff, that are, some of your staff might still be on Office 365 or Exchange, and your students are on PC, you might have to have an next record, records, not around me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you might be in the situation where Somebody's really afraid that your students are going to on your staff, and your staff are going to on your students, so you want to have that student domain name, whatever it is. We really encourage you to get away from that. We want to see you have your naming convention to differentiate. Put a number, put a graduation year in the name. Something like that, rather than aliases. You have disability settings you set, you can set, you put footers on their emails. There's other ways to differentiate, rather than subdomain Huh. So, admin roles. So we got a domain, we got to have an admin role. What's the number one admin role we have to have inside the console? Super admin. That's the lower G dot account, right? So when I'm doing your audit, we're going to run a scan about all the admin roles you have in your environment. And some of the things you find is like this super admin account, so here's the daily account. Do you have any of those, Scott? Do you still? <laughs> so what does it mean when I say we see super admin accounts as daily use accounts? Anybody? Yeah, so my Carl Beamer at AmplifiedIT.com account would be my super admin account. We want you to get away from that. We want you to have Super Carl or Super Dave or Super Mike or SA Dash or something like that. You get in the habit of going to the three dots, enabling you how to get on logging in as your super admin account, doing what you need to do, and moving on. Okay? Separating out those, those areas. We tend to do things with our daily use account that we shouldn't be doing with the super admin account. Okay? So separating out those environments. Some of the other best practices we have in here enforce two step verification. So who in here is a super admin in DC? Okay, now put your hands, keep your hands up. How many of you have two-step verification enabled? Well, it didn't be too bad, not too many of them though. So that's definitely a requirement for those super admin accounts. Scott, do you have two-step verification enabled? He will, he promises. So two-step verification, the primary modality these days is Google Prompt on my phone over there. I log in, I get prompted for two-step verification. On my phone it says, hey, it looks like you're trying to log in from this location at this time on this device. Is this you, yes or no? I click yes, I move on. You can still select um, SMS text message. I find that a little more cumbersome. You also have the option of the Google Authenticator app. You also have the option 
uh, uh, voice codes that I think the Google Prompt is probably the best to use with the primary modality right now. Um, create separate OU for your super admins. Just an easy, clean way to manage it. Sometimes you want to do things, turn things on for your super admins if you don't want to turn off for everybody else. Anybody ever heard of backup codes? One gentleman. So let's say that this gentleman over here was wandering around, he dropped his phone, ran it over with his car, the next computer he walked up to, he got prompted for a two-step verification. What would he do? He can use his backup codes to log in. A physical code on a physical piece of paper, you lock up, keep somewhere, keep one in your wallet, whatever you need, or keep just go find another super admin. Uh, <coughs> what else we got? Anybody creating any user created password roles or managers, admin roles? What do you got? Okay. So user managers, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, password manager is usually the number one one that comes up. And the cool thing about setting up a password manager admin role is I can give a teacher or a librarian or a media specialist at one school, as long as they're tied to an OU, the ability to set passwords just for that OU or just for that school. You need to lock it down or you can open it up based on the community. But you have a lot of ability inside the admin console to create user data roles. Okay. <coughs> OU structure. So why is OU structure? It helps you generalize, helps you turn services on and off, helps you control your environment, differentiate between staff and students, differentiate between grade levels, those kinds of things. Might be hard for some of you to see in the room to remember you have access to the slide deck, but that's the basics for our OU structure that we recommend. Okay? Just briefly, I'll go through it. So if we start at the top left and move down and to the right, we're getting more and more granular. When you're at the root, hopefully we're going to set 50% of the settings. When we're at the staff, hopefully we can set 75% of the staff settings right there. As we break out into roles for our staff, the most important OU is that IT OU, not because we are the most important people, but because there's things we want to turn on for IT that we don't want to turn on for everybody else. Okay? Breaking those sorts out. For the students, anybody know why we break it out into elementary, middle, high? Yeah, they're different populations or different groups. If you kind of group all of our elementary school students together, all our middle school students together. And if we have this breakout, that means at the elementary OU, I can build a walled garden. I can block emails from going externally or being sent externally. I can set up drive and docks in a walled garden. But I don't have to apply it to the entire student population. And if I had 5, 10, 15, 20 elementary schools, I don't have to do it one at a time, one at a time. <coughs> Going down into school name, the story that I always tell about this is that when I came into education as uh, something a parent, I thought because I had five elementary schools in my district, they would all be things exactly the same. Was I right? Not even close. I had one with a magnet school, one with ESL, one with dual immersion. Two were kind of stereotypical elementary schools. One had iPads, one had Chromebooks, one had PCs. One was lucky to have any technology at all. So they all needed to be treated differently. They needed to have that granularity. Same thing when we go down to grade level. Grade level might simply be one or two settings or one or two apps that we're pushing out. But having that granularity lets you treat them that way, right? We have a little dotted line there that talks about dependent on provisioning method. It means that are you doing automated provisioning or are you manually creating a new and using it? If you're doing automated, you stop at that dotted line. Everything to the left, hopefully you're set it and forget it. If you're not, we want you to have graduation year. Simply because it's easier to set, to move an entire graduation year for you up as they graduate than it is to go find the individual students. Does that make sense? This is the basics. I don't really care what names or terms you put in the little bubbles, but that's kind of the generic breakdown that we want to use. There's other things on the right that we might add in as needed. And then we also talk about our devices. Where do we put our devices in the same structure? Anybody know? So I heard somebody say separate OU, separate. 
We see a lot of districts that create a whole separate ODU structure up here under roof called devices. It's not wrong. This is overkill. You've already spent time making this ODU structure. Why not leverage it for devices? Put the devices in the same physical location as they reside, so right under the school. Okay? Some of the things we find when we do an audit, no student OU, no or student OU no is not split down into grades of graduation. Remember anything about yours? information about OUs and the facts, the visiting options, anybody still creating users one at a time, one at a time, one at a time? Yep, it works, right? It's just time consuming, probably a smaller school district. So you're not going to do this if you have 7,000 students and this thing's happening every day. Right. Got it. Um, then you've got the other provisioning options, so you've got, you can do CSV upload, anybody done that? Same kind of thing, download uh, your users from an SIS, import them into a spreadsheet, you need five columns of data, first name, last name, uh, email address, password, and what's new for the spreadsheet. What? OU, yeah. Where did your users used to go before we had the OU option? Yeah, they all went to the root, and you had to find them and move them around manually. Okay? So great new things. It does it on the manual creation as well. Go for users. Anybody heard of Go for users? Anybody using it right now? Okay, cool. A few of you. Um, Go for users is one of the Amplified IT lab tools. It's simply a spreadsheet add-on. It starts at like $150 a year. It's based on your school size. It goes up from there. But it's just an easy way to import and export your users via a spreadsheet. And via that spreadsheet, you can do things like move them from OU to OU. To OU you can reset the passwords, you can deal with some stuff with aliases, you can get lots of information via a spreadsheet, things you might they already get familiar with. So it's not fully automated, it's the step between CSV and Google Cloud Directory C. Who here is using this tool? It looks like about 20 of you. What's the price of Google Cloud Directory C? Zero, that's right. It's free and it's supported, and it's promoted by Google and us. A very powerful tool. Doesn't take a full-blown server. Most of us run it on a virtual server, a little tool server, secondary server, something like that. It does its job. The one I was talking about, you can use the mapping and filtering rules to move data pieces from one place to another. You can also map uh, groups. And what else can you guys move across? Google built their own Google Cloud directory server. Is it easy, hard? Easy? So you were, at the beginning, you were you were synchronizing all users and your structure. Right. Yeah, we don't normally recommend synchronizing your structure because you're pulling everything over for AD. So either don't check that or use those exclusion rules. Like, if you don't want anybody with the name Carl, you can write an exclusion in there. Take that attribute and not have anybody like you coming to your community. Okay? Um, Amplified IT Google for Education Sync. It's our product, our homegrown product on Python scripting. The power of this tool is that it's born in conversations with you. You don't put your students in the AD anymore. So how are you going to get them from your SIS to G Suite? Anybody skip AD with their students or not put their students in AD anymore? Doesn't sound like it's come here yet because I didn't see any hands go up, but it's coming then. Because as we go more one-to-one -one with G-Suite or one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, there's not really a reason to put in the AD anymore. 
So this basically can reach out to an SFTP server or FTP server, grab a CSV that you're exporting from your SAS, and then do the ads losing to it. And it's not just your SAS, it might be your HR system, your business system, anything. And we can strip all the ads, moves, and changes, suspensions, everything in that system. Okay? Unfortunately, that one's not free, but works with a really good group of people, Keegan Morris and his team. How about G Suite Password Sync? Anybody use it? How much does it cost? That's right. Free. Free 99, is that what some people call it? Free 99. So this is just a tiny little tool that runs on your primary and secondary domain controllers, and it will synchronize your AD passwords up to G Suite. Okay? It's unidirectional. Both this one and Google Cloud Directory Suite are unidirectional. You can only pull data from your, your domain and push it to G Suite. You can't pull anything down. Okay? This one basically sits there and lurks in the background for password changes that your users initiate, grabs those passwords, and then caches them and sends them up to the user. So you log into AD the same way you would use it. Okay? Google Apps Manager. Anybody know about this tool? Yeah, more of you lift with your hands then. So you got scripting people? Do you really like scripting? Not far off. So we, what we like to say about this tool is this is the ultimately powerful tool. And with ultimate power comes Ultimate responsibility, that's right. You can do great things with this tool. You can break lots of stuff with this tool. It is free. It is command line. It's like PowerShell for G Suite or DOS for G Suite. Okay? Like I said, great things you can do with it. <coughs> it's supported by a community out there. Jay Lee was actually the one who wrote it. He actually works for Google now, but it's allowed to keep this project going. There's a wiki, there's cheat sheets. Again, it's free. It is something we all need to have in our back pocket, just in case we need to save our back zone. Okay? But it's not something I really know in place. There's more information about where you can get it. Core services. What are our core services in DC? Give me one or two. There's a symbol up there on the screen. Yep, drive, drive and docs, um, sites, classroom, mail, keep. Yep, I like keep because there's nothing said in it. So the biggest difference you need to know between core services and additional services, core services are covered by the Google for Education contract, and you're allowed to call support for them, or chat to support. Additional services, those, I don't know what it is now, 41 to 50 something additional services, Google Photos, Google Plus, Double Take Campaign Manager, all those weird things in additional services, they each have their own individual terms of service, you cannot contact Google support. Okay, that's the biggest difference. There is a little bit of chaos with the additional services right now. Um, anybody remember when you used to turn on a service, you'd get that pop-up that told you if it was a 13 plus or an 18 and below service? Remember that? It's gone. So right now it's really hard to figure out what the service is. Stay tuned, it looks like it's gone. It looks like in the next six months or so, we're going to have a new way for managing our apps. Uh, I can't show you anything because it's NDA and I've barely even seen it, but there's going to be some big changes in the app world coming up. Okay? <clears throat> One of the big uh, tools and big core services is Gmail. How many of you are using Gmail? Okay, how many of you are doing both? Gmail, Office 365, Gmail, and Exchange? Okay. It's, it's it's not, it's not out of the norm, folks. It's definitely something that a lot of folks are doing, utilizing multiple services and multiple email systems. So, since we're doing okay, it looks like I'm talking too fast, we can actually jump into email real quick and look at a couple of things. So I'm going to go into the admin console, and hopefully, I don't think the camera can see it, but do the best we can. We can jump into apps, and we're going to log in again. Hold on. I just want to show you a couple of new things inside of here. A couple of key things. So anybody build a walled garden with you You know, sorry. Who might be? What's the walled garden do for us? A lot of us coming over from Exchange or from Office 365 are kind of 
thinking that Gmail doesn't have a lot of capabilities, believing it has a lot of capabilities, you've got to go in and manage it. So what we can do inside of here, under the advanced settings inside of Gmail, is open this up, and then anytime we're in here, on the left-hand side, when we see the OU structure, we can manage settings based on the OU. Okay? It's not a domain-wide thing. When you don't see the OU on the left, it is a domain-wide setting. <coughs> I'm going to scroll down here to something called restricted delivery. And this is where we would set up our wall garden. Right here, restricted delivery. I go in here and click on configure, give it a name like wall garden for elementary school students, and then go ahead and click add this up. Super simple to block internal and external delivery of emails for our younger students. And it's definitely something we see done a lot of the time for elementary and middle school. I even know of a school district in California that does this for the entire staff and student. I'm not sure why we want to the student staff, but they can do it for everybody else. Um, some other things that are important inside of email, this is under the advanced settings, is this one right here. You guys may not know about it. And sometimes we tell people, don't tell anybody about this. How many of you have users who are Outlook users? How many of you want those people to get away from being an Outlook user? So I wouldn't tell them about this tool if you want that. This is a synchronization tool where you can synchronize your GC mail back over to Outlook. A lot of times when we're working with customers, we just say, hey, pull off the bandage and just move on. Um, there are some good videos out there on YouTube that show that you have about 95 plus percent of the capabilities inside of email that you had in Outlook. It just looks different, has a different name, has a different color, especially since Google Next just happened last month all the new things that are happening in Gmail. What else do we have in here that I can pull out? Uh, unextended external reply warning. This just means, hey, if you, this is the first time you've replied to somebody outside your domain, the system is going to warn you. I would recommend turning that on. It's just a good little snapshot to warn a user so they don't accidentally email somebody they didn't want to. I'm going to go back out here to the settings to email show you guys a new tile or a new card. They call these things right here tiles or cards, sections. There's a new section called safety. Anybody know safety setting is in here? Safety section is in here? It's getting close to a year old now. And what this is, is we believe it was an outcome from, remember two years ago when there was the big phishing scheme, a phishing scam that Google got caught up in? Ever since then, Google's been making a lot of improvements on how they capture so this safety section, what we recommend here, is coming in and turning on all these different areas. So the first area that we see is related to attachments. Protect against encrypted attachments from untrusted senders. Protect against attachments and scripts from untrusted senders. You get the gist. We're protecting against malicious intent via attachments. We have three choices of what we do when we turn them on. Keep the, e keep the email in the inbox and show a warning. Move the email to spam or quarantine. What we recommend is keep it in the inbox and show the warning. Like I was telling this gentleman over here earlier, we recommend you turn this on for 1 OU, okay? Turn on all the settings, but only for 1 OU, like the ID stuff. So you can learn first. If you turn it on for everybody, you usually find out that either your mail system, or the county out for bed, or the DSC, or the lawyers you work with, somebody's mail is not set up right. And so everything that comes from them is going to get a warning on it. And what we don't want is good emails getting false flags. Okay? We want the emails or the warnings to be positive and good enough. If the emails have false warnings on them, what are you going to start doing? Just ignoring them, right? The whole point of this is that that big warning that shows up will give them a split second to think, should I eat? Should I open this? Or should I call the IT folks to that? Okay. So definitely an area we recommend turning on. And there's one thing I want to show you in here. It is this one right here. It's called, it's got a check mark. It's brand new. It's only about two weeks old. And it says, apply future recommended settings automatically. Whose recommended settings? Yours? I, I don't know. Ned, are these your recommended settings? You didn't even know I'm talking. Okay. Okay, so do you trust Ned to apply the proper settings to your domain? So I would say at this point right now, uncheck this. Let you guys remain in maintain control, OK? 
okay? It is on by default from what I see, okay? Um, you can click on the learn more, I think it takes you to the blog post, but I'm pretty sure it was on by default. All right, we could spend two hours talking about email, but I gotta move on. So what else do we have in there? Um, email safety, we just talked about that. Google Drive and Team Drive. So Google Drive, we can do the same kind of thing. We can set up a walled garden inside of Google Drive. Can anybody do that? Restrict sharing. Oh, that was a lot of confused looking people. Hold on a second, let me show you that. So really quick, back in D Suite. I'm gonna go to the core services. I'll give you another another tip when we're in here as well. So I'm gonna go to drive and docs now. I'm gonna go to the What's the most frustrating thing about the admin console? So stay tuned. I just saw the new admin console last week. Uh, I saw pictures of it and a couple of different things. They say by the end of Q3, so we're we'll talking what is that? August, September timeframe, we might start to see it. Also, if you guys can see the URL at the top of the screen, it says admin.google.com slash AC. That AC is a representation of parts and pieces of the new admin model. If you don't see the AC, you're on the old one. If you see the AC, you're on the new one. Okay? So inside of Drive and Docs, just really quick, this is where we would set up the walled garden for the sharing options. Click on the little pencil. And for, let's say we go over here to our student menu, and we would say, hey, for my younger students, for my elementary school students, I don't want them sharing documents out of this outside the domain nor do I want them to be shared documents from outside the window. So I would turn it off, sharing outside, and I would uncheck the one right below it. Okay, and that's creating that moat or that walled garden. If you didn't know that, it's a powerful little thing you can set up for your younger students or your students who are in a timeout OU, penalty box, something like that. Anybody know about team drives? Scott, do you use team drives? That's better than Beavis and Butthead or something like that. I already said in my complaint too, so. Actually, that would be a good place. So, what's the biggest difference about Team Drives compared to a regular My Drive? Just live there, what? Stays. The key thing is there is no owner of a Team Drive. Carl Beamer leaves the district. I put a bunch of stuff in the Team Drive, it doesn't affect those files and folders at all. Okay. Um, as per what Scott said, what we're recommending right now with Team Drive is the only people who can create Team Drive is you and the IT department. You create the naming convention and the structure. As soon as you've done that, you assign somebody to be a content manager. That's the person who's going to add or remove users, add or remove content. Okay. A lot of times when I do an audit, we'll run off a list of the Team Drives. Some people didn't realize it was on for everybody students and staff across the board. So they've got a thousand or ten thousand team drives. How do you clean up a team job? How do you get rid of it? So first thing you have to do is add yourself to that team drive as a full permission to use content management. Then you have to delete the content. Then you can delete that team drive. And that's one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. No easy way to do it at this point in time. Okay? So make sure you're maintaining control of your team drives. 
um, file stream versus backup and sync. Live file stream, backup and sync. Which one is enterprise? Yep, live file stream. Backup and sync that Google promotes as being for the consumer model. Um, what can drive file stream do with TV? Save directly to drive from your computer, open up um, office documents without having to open them up in office and open them up in that environment. Um, it's drive file stream is basically leveraging cloud storage and not saving anything local unless you're pulling it there or saving it offline. Okay? Backup and sync is the opposite. It's pulling a copy of everything down local. Okay. <coughs> Real life audit finding. So it says docs can be shared outside the names for all users. That was upsetting that I showed you. So, do you guys use the wall garden for students at all? Yeah, we use the wall garden for in here, I couldn't do your job, so don't worry about it. All right, so what else we have in here? Hangouts and meet and hangout, hangouts, meet and hangouts chat. Nice and confusing, so um, what did Google use that? Anybody remember Google Talk? Allo, Duo. So now we have Google Hangouts, we have Google Meet, and we have Hangouts chat. We're all good with that. We're stable for about two months, or four months. Now what's happened is Google Hangouts is going to transition. They're going to break out the voice and video aspect and dedicate that to Google Meet. Okay, that's, it's going to be rebranded to be called Google Meet. And then the chat functionality is going to be fully moved over to Hangouts Chat. Does anybody have Hangouts Chat turned on? Way in the back, right over there. So if you don't have it turned on, I recommend you turn it on to your IT department at least. It's basically you go to chat.google.com and you're in a Slack-like environment. You're in an all-in-one chat environment with rooms and threads and bots. You can use bots like an athlete bot. They can schedule appointments for you. There's a crazy bot where you can ask the bot to find a Gizzy if somebody laughing and it'll automatically do that. There's people building bots for it. But basically get the hang of it, learn how it works, because it's probably something you're going to have to turn on to your staff university if you're comfortable with your staff to do it. Uh, Hangouts chat has a place in Vault now. So before, Google Hangouts, the only way you capture those messages, in, uh, those chat messages, was having it go through the email system. Okay, and then when you did a Vault discovery, you would capture them in the email discovery. Hangouts chat actually has a section in Vault where you have to turn on, turn on the retention values. Okay? The meet, they're continuing to work on meet and making it more robust, adding more capabilities to it. Um, you can't do, you can't put fake hats and mustaches and sunglasses on people like you used to be able to do with people hangouts, but it's still, and it's a good and robust thing. Um, there are some new stuff coming to the hangouts chat, uh, yeah, hangouts chat application, allowing external users. They're going to go back to embedding, embedding it into the Gmail platform. Right now it's its own separate uh, URL. So they're going to put it back in the Gmail so you can see it all in one instance. Just like you it, uh, Google. Okay, that's all coming this year. <coughs> Google Classroom. How many people use it? Usually Google Classroom is the thing that drove adoption of GC. Teacher went to the GSSE Summit or Google Summit with that team. They came back. They either turned on the domain and didn't tell you, or they said, hey, I really want to use this, and you guys started building that. And you can see so just one quick thing I want to show you inside of Google Classroom. I'm going to jump back in. <coughs> Who do you allow to create classrooms? Anybody? Any? 
for verified only. Right. If I don't set this setting to verified only inside of Classroom, so it's under Classroom app, and inside of here it's under General Settings, and then we have this setting right here. Anyone, all pending and verified, verified teachers only. It's not set to verified teachers only, who creates Classroom? Everybody, including our students. And so they go into this section right here with this group, and they sit there as a pending teacher, but since we're allowing pending to create, They've created a classroom and who knows what they're doing in the classroom. So set it to verify teachers only, manage the group. If you don't want to go into this group on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to add or verify teachers, add in a nested group, okay? Add in your all staff group. I don't care if the bus driver and the custodian can make classrooms. We're trying to keep the students out. Is there any reason why a student might have a legitimate reason to make a classroom? Buddy. Might be a project. We usually, we usually run into it for leadership, student government, um, something like that, club, something like that. But those are people we've vetted, and we've just, we've, uh, understood. Maybe they have to add in a co-teacher, an adult to supervise it. But there is a legitimate reason. They're just not going to do it on their own. <clears throat> so real life finding: classroom teacher permission set to all pending and verified teachers can create. We run that report during the audit. We find that we've got 25 students in there creating classrooms and added all their buddies into the classroom. There's really no way for us to monitor that at all. Anything special about that? Nothing? Okay. Just don't take it. Um, yeah, that's what I'm not sure um, we, uh, 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 Little sis. So Little Sys is a classroom integration tool, and basically Little Sys will connect to your SIS, basically you're going to grab that CSV, and we're going to manage the classroom for you with Little Sys. It's actually going through a cool transition right now where it's two parts. It's the, it's the automation of the account creation and also a dashboard. Something that classroom has never had before is a dashboard to give other people access into what's going on. It's really was an all or nothing or just a teacher system. This new dashboard will let you give the principal access into seeing what's happening in the classroom or a TA or an associate teacher or something like that. But the power in Little Sis is that it's automatically going to create your, move your students around, take the classes, move your teachers around, do all that dynamically. And then another key feature is guardians. How many people know that you can have guardians get uh, email reports about what's happening in the classroom? Okay. Right now, if you don't do something like Little Sis, who has to manage the guardians? Who? I hear it. Teachers. Maybe that's not a big deal. I'm sure they already have some access to your student information system. The problem is, is that one time when a teacher forgets to manage that and there's a custom battle going on, there's a restraining order going on, something, and somebody gets information they're not supposed to. It can cause some big problems. If you're automating that, it will follow the lead of the SNS. Okay? Little Sis is one of our popular tools out there right now. It thinks to something called Backpack, which is a whole other big conversation. But if you're interested in talking about automating the creation and management of the classroom, it's definitely a good place to start. Okay? Google Vault. What's Google Vault? Yeah. 
e-retention and discovery. Okay, so when the AR HR director comes in and says, hey, Carl, we need to uh, pull all the emails and stop to the Senate for the last couple of months, or the lawyers send in a request, or the police show up, or you get a Freedom of Information Act request, those kind of things, right? E retention and discovery. It is not, I don't think I have a slide for that, it is not a disaster recovery board. We don't go to vault and electronically recover all the data back to the user's inbox or a drive file or hangout chat or something like that. It's easy to get to this point. I can export things out of vault, PSP files, inbox, those kind of things. And I could probably manipulate it to where I'm going to re-import them from PSP back into the suite. That's not the intent. Okay? They're intended not to electronically recover. Recover. Um, about Google Next. So two years ago, they started increasing what was involved. It used to be just Google Next. Anybody go back far enough to remember when it was Postini? And what was the difference between, what was the difference between Postini and Nina? Involved, sorry. Cost money. Postini wasn't cheap. I think it was like four to seven dollars a user every year. And at some point in time, somebody had a great idea to get involved in education. So it's free retention. And I've never heard of anybody running into any limits on it. So. Um, we do talk about IT folks getting out of the business of running those discoveries. So this might be a tip or trick. You can say that guy, that guy Carl told us to do this. Because that guy Carl got really tired after 50 years in the districts of doing the investigations. What we recommend now is give your HR director, your assistant superintendent, those people asking you to do those things capabilities to go in and do the investigations themselves. You'll turn it on, you'll set it up, you'll train them, you'll help them, they do the investigations on them. Kind of keeps you out of the room. You don't need to know, right? I get tired of knowing who might or might not do it. Okay? Um, I think that's good. We can come back to Vault if we need to. Um, Google Vault is on for everyone. So that was a key audit finding. So that means if we go and look at the surface, the core service of Vault, you see it said on for everyone on the right hand side. Why don't I want that to be on for everyone? So this is saying that it sounds like everyone can get into the e-discovery portal. So even if Vault, the service, is on for everyone, it doesn't mean they can get into the portal. It just means they all have access to this icon up here, which we just don't want them to have. Okay. You still have to have a role to get into Vault, um, but we just want to take away even the, the link to it, and that's a simple thing, okay? So then I can do that. Since we're here, I can show you guys something, I think I'm going to show you guys some slides. There's a new functionality inside the Adler Council called the Groups. It's the ability to manage the service, turn a service on with a group, okay? So this kind of relates to Google Vault. What we're recommending right now is you come over to Google Vault in your admin console and you turn it off for everybody to know about it. Oops. So we come in here, we click on it, and we would turn it off for everybody. Then what we would do is we would create a group over here under the three icons, under directory, under groups, and we would call that group Vault Access Group. And then, we come back into the, the settings area, we click on groups, and we would find that vault group. Maybe a little scroll funny. There we go. So I think we have one called here. Uh, it's called vault access group. And then those the people in that vault access group were the director of IT, the HR director, the assistant CEO, or assistant superintendent. We would turn Vault back on just for that group. This is a new functionality, the ability to turn a service on with groups. Okay? Very, very limited right now. It can only turn something on. It can't turn it off. It also cannot manage service settings. It can only manage at the service level. Okay? Is there any other service that you might want to turn on for a select group of individuals? People who cross the OU structure. Okay. I was thinking three. So two foot, anybody can think of 
talked about Google Photos. Turning those on for the yearbook folks. Okay, definitely something we could do with this service. Let's see, what else we got? Scott's reminding me, hey, we only have five minutes. I was thinking we got till three o'clock. So, lots happened at Google Next last two weeks ago. 122 updates. Take this slide deck back, look through those updates. A good portion of them have to do with machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, Google Cloud Platform, but there's a good 40, 50, 60 that relate to what we do every day, okay? Control access with groups, that's a slide about what I was just talking about. G Suite Secure LDAP, anybody know what that is? Being able to use Secure LDAP for directory services instead of AD. One of the ways the school district is using this is they don't put their students in AD anymore, but they still have a PC lab, a CAD lab, a Adobe Photoshop lab. They don't want to manage accounts. So they put a third-party client on those PCs, they point that client to secure LDAP at Google, and now the students walk up to that machine and log in with a Google account. Okay? It's in its infancy. It only can do a few things, but it's something that's going to grow over time. Manage browsers. Anybody have PCs where a student can walk up, walk in, walk up, open up Chrome, and then go out and do what they want, but it's not a managed Chrome interface? Yes, we do. You're not forcing them to log in unless you're sending out a group policy object to make them do that. This is Google's foray into managing a browser even without them being logged in. We're going to be able to push out the user policy. Only been out for a week. Basically through a token and a little install file. And now as soon as they open Chrome, they're getting more policies. Okay? Even without logging in. That was, that was not 122 updates, right? How do you guys stay informed or stay up to date with G Suite? When did Scott say, how often does G Suite change? What did Scott say? 20 minutes. I guarantee if we kind of spent time together today and we went to the admin console, I would find something I'd be like, uh, I don't know what that is. So two things, what's new release calendar? Go to that, click on the little plus button, add the what's new release calendar to your calendar. Okay. The other thing is G Suite updates blogs. Click on that on the right hand, top right hand corner. Subscribe to those emails. You will get a notification of the changes that are happening. It's not 100 percent. It's about 70 percent of what's going on, but it's a good chunk of the changes that are happening. And those blogs are really good to tell you if they're relevant to you. Do they apply to you? How fast are they rolling out? Do they come on by default? All of those kinds of things. Okay, North American Collaborative, good way to stay up to date. I know Scott wanted to talk about it. <laughs> I'll have hours tomorrow. There's about a couple more slides up. There's a slide that says from like noon to three tomorrow. Send me an email. I'm happy to meet you somewhere. We can talk for 15, 20 minutes. Um, we are doing a boot camp in Portland Public Schools. I think it's Evergreen or something like that school. Boot camp has to do with spending a day in the admin console and taking a certification at the exam in the afternoon. Sign up for that if you want. The slide deck is yours. Lots more information. How many of you heard of Google Services offer? 
Okay, everybody needs to hear this. Come see me in the booth. Come catch me tomorrow. This has to do with you getting free money from Google because you bought Chromebooks and licenses and you able to spend those credits on things from Amplified IT or other providers. Okay, thank you everybody for your attention. I know we didn't get far enough, but I'll talk to you more. <laughs>